Welcome to another figure week, hard surface week, organic week. Hey everyone, my name is Ahmed al -Douri. I'm a concept artist and former instructor at Art Center College of Design, Brainstorm, CCS, CGMA, and various other places. And I would like to introduce to you this digital painting course that I've created. But before we get into anything, I just want to thank you for the support you've all given me this whole time. And with the support of so many of you, I've been able to put together everything I know about painting into this digital painting course. You want to become a pro, illustrator, concept artist, or even just a hobbyist, but you don't have a clear map to get there. And that's where I come in. I spent the last six months compiling everything I know from my 20 years of art practice, and I've turned it all into a map. Starting with foundations such as rendering shapes, color theory, painting basic subjects, understanding brushwork, brush economy, all that fun stuff, deconstructing the skull, drawing it from every angle, all the way to master studies, stylized painting, and you'll find yourself at the end of the course doing a concept art project based on everything that we learn in the first 14 lessons. So how does it work? Well, you sign up, you watch the lectures, do the assignments, post them to the community page if you want, and treat it as a self-study, except for those of you who have signed up for the weekly meeting where I personally critique your work in a virtual classroom setting. I believe learning by repetition is super important. That's what I've sort of presented a lot in this course, and the assignments are tailored for that, as adapted from my time teaching at Art Center. And each of these lessons have step-by-step -step explanations in real time. If you've ever seen my videos, you know exactly how I teach. And this course is intended to be a substitute for a college-level course, but you don't have to pay the four or $5,000 per class, racking up maybe 200K in debt. With my custom design course, you'd be paying a fraction of that. And of course, I also have payment plan options if you don't want to pay for the whole thing at once. Thank you for watching this, and I'll see you soon. Hey everybody and welcome back to Digital Artcast. Um, this is the first episode back after a year hiatus, um, taking a little time away from myself and uh, reinventing what I was doing. Um, but again, we wanted to bring back some of the traditional interviews we were doing also on the channel. So this one is one of the first ones we've been able to do this year with our guest. Um, it's again great to just be back and doing these. I have definitely been enjoying you guys reaching out and messaging me, um, talking about how even through the year I was away you were kind of reliving and revisiting uh, some of the podcasts I had done previously and uh, just enjoying uh, the time and the content that was there um, I forget when I go back and look at my YouTube channel that there is over 100 videos there for people to enjoy over five years worth of content so um, I'm really thankful and glad that you guys have enjoyed it and thank you again for reaching out um, my guest today uh, is someone that I have seen on socials for the last year um, especially just while I've been diversifying my brand and what I'm going to try to do I've been looking for people who are slightly different to the, the typical guests we have. You know, typically we have uh, concept artists, 3D artists, people in the games and film industry, um, people who are doing maybe more of the traditional roles you see within games development uh, and film. But today we are talking to someone who has a slight tangent on what we uh, do in the entertainment industry. And I thought it'd be interesting to get him on and talk about his career, uh, his journey through what he's done and where he is today and how he's kind of got there. Um, 
if you can introduce and uh, you know talk about yourself but uh we're bringing on a guest today mr luke uh luke whitelock and uh we're going to talk about your career so uh thanks firstly luke for coming on and uh thanks for being here thanks for having me yeah no great um yeah so i mean i, I am a i'm a set designer in the film tv industry been doing it for about 20 years um i studied at uh, bournemouth arts institute i did a degree in um, production design um, or film and animation but specializing in production design and um yeah i've been I, so i graduated in 2004 and then i moved to london i uh, didn't really have any uh, contacts or anything i just kind of did it with a, moved up here with a friend and we both he was a director a wannabe director and, and we just kind of you know arrived in london and just started phoning around and trying to get work and Thank everything and yeah, exactly. And I, I ended up with, um, I had what, well, I'd say I had no contact. I had one contact, which was a guy uh, called Paul Cripps, who's the production designer on um, uh, Ted Lasso okay. at the moment. And uh, back then he was doing sort of more um, TV stuff mm -hmm. um, uh, for sort of Channel 4 and things like that. And uh, I just basically pestered him for like three months, <laughs> just kept phoning him every other week and was like, you know, I got a job, got a job. Mm -hmm. And he eventually, he relented and he said, all right, I'm starting this thing, uh, Sugar Rush Channel 4. Cool. Which if you remember that, it was quite yeah. a um, groundbreaking series. Um, at the time, yeah. At the time. And it had, uh, it was Andrew Garfield, one of it, one of his first shows. Um, he was in it, yeah. Yeah, he plays the, played the neighbour. And, yep. uh, and that was it really. I just kind of got on that. It was really quick. It was like a baptism of fire. So yep. like, you know, you kind of, you learn or you think you learn at, at university what you're going to be doing in the film industry or the TV industry, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, when you actually get into it, it's like, oh God. And I had, you know, and I kind of had this bashed up old car and they wanted me to sort of travel around all the prop houses, picking up props. Mm -hmm. I was doing a little bit of graphics work. I was dressing sets. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't do any drafting to design the sets. Mm -hmm. um, at that stage, but I was doing standby. Um, I was driving down to Brighton to to do second unit and all sorts of stuff. So it was a really great, like little um, introduction to the film and TV world. Yep. Um, and that ran for it was a really short job. It was like eight weeks, I think, mm -hmm. if that. And um, yeah, twelve hour days, six days a week really hard work fantastic um, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> at the time i was like oh no what have i done yeah. <laughs> it's horrible yeah. um but uh but I stuck with it and uh, kept going mm -hmm. and um you know it's 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 the jobs you do mm -hmm. but um you don't realize it at the time but you're you're always meeting people because it's a big freelance industry so you're always meeting people and then out of the blue you get a phone call from someone who says oh um heard you were working with so and so on sugar rush they recommended you yeah would you like to come for an interview or whatever and that happened for uh the watchman the, the film cool um which i didn't get mm -hmm. um they phoned me up i was going to go and go and do it and then then it moved it they pushed it they pushed the production right and i missed it and i ended up doing some more tv work for a bit right. um and then i got my first feature film job um I, i'd been you know we were chatting beforehand about this sort of thing but um <laughs> with with the work as it is now and everyone everyone is kind of stuck in this kind of limbo waiting for the films to start up after the strikes yeah very much in that sense back then there was no work around every all the feature films were sort of going to prague right. or uh, czechoslovakia or places like that and um, what was being made in the UK was just basically Harry Potter and a few other little bits and pieces. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'd waited months and months and months trying to get a job. And then on the same day, I got a call for three jobs on the same day, which was Stardust, if you remember that film, yep. um, Flight 93, and uh, Elizabeth the Golden Age. Oh, okay. So I ended up doing three interviews mm -hmm. at three separate um uh studios one was at pinewood 
Oh, no, sorry, two were at Pinewood and one was at Shepparton. Right. Shepparton being the last one, mm-hmm. and they offered me the job on the spot, so I ended up taking that, and that was The Golden Age, right? which was the sequel to Elizabeth, the um, Shaker Kapoor film, mm-hmm. um, with uh, Kate Blanchett. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, that was it, really. That was my that was my in. I got my foot in the door mm-hmm. uh, then. That was two, 2005. Right. Um, and I just started at the bottom, you know, making tea getting lunches for people um so you're doing kind of like a runner role basically yeah exactly yeah filling up the photocopier um opening the offices in the morning making sure everybody everyone had everybody teas and coffees and lunch <laughs> yeah all the, all the boring stuff but yeah. what's great about that and it's kind of been lost a little bit mm-hmm. late you know in the last sort of five to ten years is yeah. that um you get to meet everyone and and go around all the departments and learn you know, because I was taking drawings down to construction and I know I was taking drawings over to the plaster shop or I was taking them to the model makers or I was taking them to the vision effects uh, guys or the special yeah. effects guys, sorry. And um, you get chatting with the department heads or whatever and then you say, oh, how do you, how do, you do that? And then they show you and you absorb all this stuff like osmosis. You don't realise you're doing it until sort of like years down the line. You go, oh, I remember we did that on, I don't know, whatever it was. Rock yeah, and roll production, up, and then you bring example. on to the next and, one. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, and we could do that here, and they go, "Oh, right, okay." You know, so so that's how I learn. Um, I'd like to say I learned everything at uni, but I really didn't. Uh, like, I, I oh, think no that's a real. Yeah. yeah, I think a lot of the people at university um, would be it would be good for them to hear that because so many come out and think they're a production designer or they think they're an art director, and it's like that. Yeah. You, you you really have got to um, put the hours in, put the work in. Yep. You can't expect to walk into a production designer role straight from university. It's just not going to happen. It's just, um, I was going to say, it's just to just interject, but it's, yeah, it's the reality of, I think, just university students is the fact that, like, even in my class, when I was going in as a mature student, and I was in my late 20s at the time when I was going in to start uni, um, but out of a class of, like, 35, there's only two of us I know, me included, are working, you know, so... Yeah, it's very slim pickings. Yeah, yeah, and and it, it's um, you know, you kind of you go into the job and and uh, and I, I just basically worked my way up through over the course of several years. Mm. Um, doing the odd jobs, doing other stuff. Yeah. yeah, so you do. I mean, I mean, when I did it, mm. it was kind of well established that you would do sort of five years as a sort of art department assistant. Right. And then five years as a junior, or four or five years mm-hmm. as a junior, and then four or five years as an assistant art director, and then uh, or as a draftsman, then then an assistant art director, then yeah, then then art director. So right. you know, after after sort of fifteen twenty years, you get up to art directing level, but because there's so much work around, mm-hmm. uh, or was, mm-hmm. you know, and there's so many so many jobs through all the all the. Um, uh, the streaming services that have come in in the last sort of five to ten years. Yeah. The content, the amount of content. I hate calling it content, but yeah, it is what it is. Uh, they, you, you'll go on a job now, whereas 10, 15 years ago, you go on a job and you know, you knew everyone on a job. Like oh, everyone knew each other in the film industry. That was yeah, such a small industry. Much it's the same with games. Yeah, industry. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if you didn't know them by you know but you know them know them you, you you'd have heard of them at least yeah. and um now you go on a job and you find out you know the supervising art director you're like i've never heard of this person who are they and you look them up and they've done like five things ever mm-hmm. and you're like how are they a supervising art director mm-hmm. so when i started out so all supervising art directors were over 50 60 years old yeah now all supervising art directors are like 35 you're like well, how's that happened <laughs> it hap- I mean, it's it's a weird thing, even with the games industry, where I've found that, like, as you were talking about the the progression, I was thinking, God, that's a long time to be doing that. But because a lot of the guys I know have entered, maybe like, you know, when I was coming out of university, and you know, when I was finishing up in 2017, 2017 2018 and I was doing runner jobs and interning places, I was meeting people there then who are now our directors, and they've done maybe seven or eight years in the industry. Um, but like. I was talking to Ian McCaig in our last interview and he was talking about this phenomenon where he's, I mean, he's in his sixties, obviously, you know, and he's worked on everything for Star Wars and everything, but he was saying, you've got people in their thirties now who are drawn like 
they've been drawn for 60 years like because the the information overload of the you know the internet exploded and there's so many online tutorials there's so many um you know there's no gatekeeping information a lot of people are like passing down stuff on how to get better quicker and how to learn things like you're obviously doing your courses now um i think the difference with your industry is that you know there's been less of like the online tutorial feeding back into what to do for the industry to get in and how to work um whereas the concept art people and games people have done that i think since the early 2010s um and then there's been this whole generation now of people who have this huge vat of knowledge super quick so are, who are now quickly progressing up the ladder because you know they go to a, a talk you know every other year with an art director who stands in front of them and goes this is what you need to do and this is what you look for and this is how i would feedback and then they just absorb that knowledge like a sponge and then they mm. just ramp up production super quickly um so i think it's just the explosion in the last 10 years of the internet that's just like birthed all these yeah. art directors into the industry so yeah yeah that's a good good uh good um analysis definitely but um it it, it it does create um there's a certain amount of like i don't want to say animosity but it's like mm. there's a there's a yeah it is animosity <laughs> it's uh it's uh it's pe- people do not want to you know certainly someone who's been been in the art department for you know since the 80s or whatever yeah being told what to do by a 25 year old it was kind of like the the hierarchy was always the older lot and yeah. you know they were always ahead of you um and it's just you know time yeah. marches on and all the rest of it but um it, it uh it is a funny funny thing the last few years it's really like the the, the whole industry is skewed massively with the amount of um investment and stuff that's come in yeah. inward investment into the uk film industry you know the studios springing up everywhere yep huge stages like we did ghostbusters um frozen empire mm-hmm. uh, in back in the summer mm-hmm. and um we were shooting that down at shimfield mm-hmm. uh studios which is a new well shimfield has been there a while because they had the, they did star wars there right um one of the star wars series was, mm-hmm. was there but they expanded the site so they built another 17 stages or something ridiculous it's like loads of stages mm-hmm um and before it, any of them were ready mm-hmm. ghostbusters had nowhere to go mm-hmm. so they picked shinfield for one stage and they basically the, the 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 construction company put all their efforts into finishing one stage one sound stage for ghostbusters mm-hmm. so we built the firehouse in inside the mm-hmm. inside this stage yeah. but the entire site was a complete uh construction site you know it was mm-hmm. a um it was a quagmire but when you get down there and you're looking around, you're thinking, God, when they finish this, this is going to be a mega studio. This is yeah. like bigger than Shepparton. Right. Um, I mean, well, at the time, Shepparton hadn't didn't done their expansion. But they're, mm. you know, Shepparton's expansion now, they've got... It, I live right by Shepparton Studios and they have got... Uh, it's a massive expansion down there. It's going to be like mm. the biggest film studio in the world by the time it's finished. But even that alone, even if they were just expanding Shepparton... You'd think, well, who's going to who's going to crew all these jobs that are going in there? Mm-hmm. And it's not just Shepton; it's Shimfield, it's Arborfield, it's mm-hmm. um, uh, Winnish, it's mm-hmm. Pinewood expanding, Leavesden are expanding, mm-hmm. um, Sky Studios. They've got another um, studios, uh, L Street, are, are being sold off, but they're building another massive thing for all the L Street lot. Wow. there's ones in Kent there's ones in Scotland and now there's yeah. in two big studios in Wales you know there's probably going to be some in the Midlands soon and probably some on the south coast you know yep. it's getting to a point where it's not London centric anymore which is great yeah um but also uh I really worry about how how they're gonna how they're gonna crew it oh I mean, they will crew it yeah they'll find the people but it's the caliber of the people and that is the problem with um the reason the americans come over here and the reason they say they come over here i mean a lot of it's to do with the tax breaks but mm-hmm. one of the main reasons is they love the finishes that we do you know the, the us the sets and the, the artisans that work in the film industry the plasterers the painters mm-hmm. the best in the world yeah and that's getting watered down watered down every year mm-hmm. um you know i talk to construction guys who cannot find 
any decent chippies and they're hiring them hiring them in from kitchen fitting companies yeah because you know they can't find you know um bespoke joiners People or they can't find the yeah. um like the 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 plasterers like fibrous plasting like mm-hmm. um proper decorative moldings mm-hmm. so you know crown moldings and stuff and running your own molds and all of that you can't find people that can do it and it takes too long to train them mm-hmm. so you end up with this sort of, sort of like hodgepodge of like fudged methods now yeah. um and it, it, it does have a detrimental effect i think so i like the idea that if these strikes have been so detrimental to everyone mm-hmm particularly the studios that they are going back to the drawing board and they are thinking about actually it's quality over quantity yeah i think that they should go back to How are because they overcome this stressful trying to keep up with all these programs that everyone watches and yeah. says oh have you seen have you have you been watching this and you go no we're in the middle of this one oh you got to watch that one and you put it on the <laughs> list and you get, you get stressed out that you haven't watched it and everyone's yeah. watching it <laughs> like it's like we, oh i hate that we talked about this when we went to see flash um last year and yeah as much as it was a decent whatever i mean i, I really hate um the actor who plays flash um oh, Ezra. Forget, yeah I think, so yeah. i mean obviously with everything that's been happening in the media and all that kind of crap but um but we went to see it you know regardless because i wanted the the you know the keaton batman moment we were all looking for it and stuff like that so um which was like, it was fine it was great it was fun to see him again take on the character and all that kind of stuff but the VFX was particularly dodgy and we actually then watched a TikTok of one of the VFX guys who worked on the film and he was like, if it looks like the VFX was done in two weeks, it was. Because mm-hmm. like, you know, there was such a rush to get the stuff out the door and it'd been delayed so many times and changed direction. And, um, you know, it's like you said with the, the Marvel movies just not hitting anymore. People, I think, up until Endgame had that whole 10 year cycle of like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. It was great. It was all well put together and well done. But after that, when the TV series yeah. started hitting and the extra movies, people were kind of just, I think, just burnt out on the, the same st- kind of stuff over and over and over again. And um, I think that it's the same problem that games are now facing as well. Like we were just talking before we started recording about um, all the guys at Riot Games who just got let go the other day because they were taking off for projects that were supposed to be, you know, during COVID there was this huge boom in games and people were getting taken on and new projects were getting started. But now, you know, that's all kind of went, you know, it's all died because now the the demand isn't there anymore because people are getting out of the house they're trying not to stay in anymore because of covid so you know all these companies are folding and things that were popped up overnight are dying and of course the, the right guys are, are all being let go the problem is there's no training structure and the fact that like a lot of these industries have you know a lot of the seniority high up or people who are art directors and have jumped in at the, the top end but then there's a huge lack of people coming up through the system where you learn and build a trade and keep in that industry for years. And like you said, you spend nearly a decade learning your whole trade, running, getting to know the, the departments and doing your trade. When I was an engineer, when I was taken on when I was 17, 18 years old, I knew nothing about engineering. I knew nothing about what my job was. But then over a three-year period, I was trained. And then yeah. after the three-year period, when my training wheels came off, I was then let loose into doing my own thing. And I learned on the job. Um, and then eventually they had a good workforce because they were bringing in trainees regularly. And that's kind of stopped halfway through my time at the at the company and then that was then the problem of when all the older guys left and retired there was nobody to fill the jobs and then they had no workforce coming through so we were all lost so yeah that whole stagnation is affecting every industry including the film and tv industry and games yeah yeah no totally and uh it, it's it's uh well i mean it, there there's no um there's no training there is no training in in the film industry there is no training like not not like there should be or like there once was you used to have apprenticeships years and years ago Mm -hmm. and now it just doesn't happen i mean i try like when i'm on a job i try and take the juniors sort of under my wing a little bit and help them as much as i can but i'm i'm too up against it to spend time trying to teach them how to do a drawing or teach them how to you know do stuff because i mean i i never (laughs) so i'm very open to giving people information and and trying to help them as like you know because i do my my tutorials yeah which is fine and uh happy to share secrets and trade secrets if that's what you want to call them and give Mm -hmm. them out when i was coming up through Mm -hmm. learning on the board trying to draft Mm -hmm. all the art directors i work with 
were like gatekeepers of the knowledge. They would not tell you how to do anything because yeah. they didn't want you taking their job. So I had to like, I had to basically like, you know, sort of peer over their board and see, oh, how do yes. they do that, or, or yeah. how do they do this, and kind of, you know, it was great then because it was on the big boards and everyone yeah. was in a, everyone was in an art department and you walk around and you could literally look at all these amazing pieces of artwork yeah. quite easily. Now everyone's on a screen, and on that screen they're inside a model twirling around doing whatever. You've got no chance as a junior coming in unless, you know, you're not going to learn anything from looking at someone's screen. Yeah. And you can't, uh, you can't stand all day and look at someone's screen either because then you get told off because you're doing nothing. No, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so unless unless there's a training thing or unless you're open to, like, you know, I tend to say to people, look, come and have a look at it. Like, come sit down, have a look. Yeah. I'll show you how to do this. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and I get them to go down to the art, go, go down to the workshops because that's yeah. another thing they don't do anymore. Yep. Yeah you know they'll they'll go uh, like on um ghostbusters we had a big sculpt can't tell you what it was but it was mm. a really impressive sculpt mm -hmm. and um it came up to the art department one day and the, and the juniors were like wow that's amazing like who did that what did it? it's like it's been down in the workshop for three weeks have you not seen it <laughs> oh no no like like do you not go down to the workshop like it was really like it really like amazed me because i was that when i was the in their, in their boots i'd be you down the way from five it. Yeah. minutes trying to find out what was going on having cups of tea with the plasterers and yeah chatting and all the rest but, of it they i mean just when sit, i used to watch the... their office on their phones now it's like yeah. oh, okay. when i used to watch the making of stuff that really got many like the first proper making of a watch was the making of episode one when lucas was doing the prequels and coming back to star wars and obviously filmed a lot of it at pinewood um mm -hmm. and it was watching the prop guys like mold the lightsabers and mold the droids and all the puppets and creatures that they used at the time and stuff and because he was still kind of doing all of those practical effects um and like yeah like that stuff that i almost went the prop making route and that's why i got into 3d prop making for games like making 3d designs and, and maya and max and stuff like that because it was almost like doing the same thing but not having to go through that route of like learning the practical stuff of building like foam and pvc and all that kind of stuff and mm. but that stuff just amazed me that that, that skill and especially when abrams came back and done Force Awakens, that creature department was obviously run up again because he was adamant of using the practical stuff again. So, yeah, yeah. it's yeah, lost art. I, it, honestly, as well, I don't care what anyone says, practical effects are, without a doubt, the best way to, to do stuff. Oh, just, just absolutely. Like, I went to see Wonka uh, the other day with my kids, and right. I was... I was I'd seen like there's there's some um, industry uh, newsletters and things that I get where showing the sets for Wonka. Right. And they look great, like the set, the big sets, like like it looked like a Viennese kind of uh, town and really lovely stuff. Mm -hmm. And then you go and see the film, and it's got like this weird CG sheen over the top of it, like they've added, like they've done the set extension, but then they've also like they've sort of I don't, know, I don't know what they've done, but the whole thing looks plastic and fake. It feels off. Weird. Yeah. I was just like, why? Why have I done that? Just, re just have the practical set. You don't need to augment it with, with CG mm. stuff. You know, you could have easily have done a real chocolate fountain. Like having a, a, a computerized computer chocolate fountain thing is just like. But again, some of these productions, because a lot of the guys we've had on some some times previously have been matte painters and guys who work in those kind of digital effects and. A lot of it just comes down to cost. Like it might just be, you know, a couple of grand cheaper just to do a quick, you know, turnaround in VFX versus like building mm -hmm. something that you feel like you're going to knock down in a couple of weeks. But I know yeah. what you mean. Like the, that's again why the only thing I've really I love that's modern that kind of plays on the practical effects is the the Unreal settings. You know, um, Favreau was using it kind of like on mm -hmm. uh, Mandalorian, like the, but the, the Unreal background, the, yeah, yeah, the light thing, the the the, the uh, like the virtual sets essentially. Yeah. The, the, yeah um because they used it on and they used it on the batman and um, where they had that the scenes up in the towers and stuff like that on top of the skyscrapers where they had the the outlook into chicago was all the the, the panels and stuff but mm. like i think a lot like you said it's like the practical stuff is just so noticeable when it's done well but then when people do the kind of cheap route or they do things that in the essence of time then yeah like you're sitting there as an audience member like what the fuck you know um yeah yeah it, and I mean, I got it from the other side working with VFX guys. Mm -hmm. You know, they 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 get given so much to do. Yep. 
because in the meetings and everything they go oh we'll do that in post and you can see the you can see the vfx guys sat there going what you know like we didn't budget for that oh uh, you know and it ends up being like uh you know they they, they signed on the job for i don't know 500 visual effects shots and they've actually ended up having to do 2800 yeah <laughs> it's like yeah. oh my god the you know and that's is the problem again with vfx houses and the race to the bottom because my friends again like my, my close friends are matte painters and it's like yeah like you know like oh i've got 60 shots today to handle like in the next eight hours and it's like it's ridiculous because you know like they're like oh we'll do it for you know we'll do it they, they're they're quoting 35 grand we'll do it for 25 and they're like great you've got the job and then it's like yeah but then people somebody quoted 35 grand because they were trying to pay people fair wages and stuff and actually plan out time to take these shots and make them look good but now because yeah. you've quoted half the price you know you've got to do it in half the time and it's yeah. crazy it is it is, yeah. it is. And, it, and it has a knock-on effect to the overall quality of the the, the production you know the mo most people when they go see a film mm -hmm. whether the film is script wise whether it's good or bad is immaterial if the effects are shit yep that's all people will talk about is yeah. how shit the the, the cg was right, you it know wrong it looked off down candy yeah. valley pets and... exactly exactly yeah. so it's um it, that's one of those really important things to get right yeah uh i think which I can imagine on something like Ghostbusters would have been also a kind of priority because it seems like a film that would rely more on the practical stuff or would have that rooted in, you know, like, I mean, which is, you know, obviously the film I think is getting a lot of hype and a lot of people are seeing it because, you know, it's proper Ghostbusters coming back and, you know, Afterlife was one thing where, like, it wasn't yeah. until, you know, obviously spoilers for that for film where the guys come back at the end, you know, and it's the yeah. whole thing of, like, them fighting together. Um, yeah. But this one exclusively is, like, you know, from the start, kind of people are knowing that, like, the original Ghostbusters are there, the new guys. Um, so it seems like one of those films that, like, the practical effects, 80s kind of stuff is going to be there a lot, so. Yeah, I think um, Jason Reitman and, uh, well, obviously Jason's got his own reasons for wanting to do Ghostbusters yeah. and his dad and all the rest of it. And, yeah. um I feel like you know he doesn't want to tamper with the with the way a Ghostbusters movie should be made, sort of thing. Yep. Yep. And certainly, Gil, uh, the director, um, is a huge you know OG Ghostbusters fan as well. Yep. So it it was a film. It's the first time it's ever happened for me. Really, is is being on a on a set where everyone there is a fan and wants it to be amazing, amazing, you know, yeah, like like the original was yeah. and still is. I mean. You know, which I've been told with some of the friends I know who worked on the Batman, they were saying it was a similar vibe, like because that was such a huge IP, and you know, even though it was trying to get made during COVID, and I've watched that making of, you know, when they tried to obviously, you know, halfway through shooting, COVID hit, and they go through the yeah. whole thing of like, you know, getting people masks and distancing and all that kind of shit, and even the fact that I never knew it was a lot of that was shot in Liverpool as well, you know, and a lot yeah. of the practical uh, scenes and stuff with, with Robert Parson. Well, they, they only did a week in in Liverpool, right? Um, I was on. The Batman. I did. Um, okay. I did. I did the orphanage. Uh, oh, cool. Um, well, a bit of the orphanage, and I yeah. did um, the uh, the train station. Drew nice. all that up. So that was that was a real really nice thing to do. Yep. In hindsight, because when yeah. I was there at the time, I'm like, oh my god, I'm on a Batman film. This is so <laughs> cool. Like, ah, ah, ah. Yeah. you know, cause I'm such a huge Batman original Batman fan, and uh, you know. Blah 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 blah, and you mm -hmm. get there, and they go right. We want you to draw this up, and it's it. It was really boring to draw up. It was like <laughs> I was like, oh, a no, train, it's a train station. station. It's no the back like, cave. It's no the wind yeah, tower. It's, it's, yeah, drew it up, get it, get it done, get it out. You know, whatever. And then it ends up becoming. I was talking to someone about this the other day. Mm -hmm. That scene uh, where he I was says, just about "I to say the exact same thing you're going to say." Yeah, it's such an iconic part of it. It, yeah. it becomes an iconic thing because of what happened in it, not yeah. necessarily because it's an amazing, elaborate set. So well, the, it, it was yeah. um, it was quite a nice thing to sort of, in hindsight, go. Actually, you know, I'm, I'm glad I got to work on that because that's that's. Well, brilliant. I was going to say it was mostly because I think because of the trailer, because when the, the the official big first trailer dropped, there was the whole thing of him beating the shit out of the guy. And yeah. they kind of like jumped out their seats at like oh my god that's incredible and i'm vengeance and that kind of shit and but like yeah it's one of the things like it's funny when you work on stuff and then you think to yourself oh god nobody's ever going to see this or, or give a shit but like then yeah. 
all the scenes go wild for the weirdest parts. And you're like, oh, well, I worked on that part. Like, I didn't realize it was going to be <laughs> it's so always good. Away. Yeah. Always the way you think, oh, no one will ever see that, and it's right in the middle of the frame. You're like, yeah. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is crazy to think a lot of these sets are like so much. I mean, the way you're talking about, you know, I don't know, obviously, you can't talk too much about it because Ghostbusters isn't even out at this point, but like the fact you're talking about, like, how, you know, because well, obviously you've seen it on your, your reels and stuff, but the, 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 and they've showed it in the, the behind the, the fiend scene stuff that they've already released where the, the firehouse is, is packed. It's not, on location in new york it's something that's been built in the, sh- the studio as i said um and that's what i'm saying it's, it's always surprising when you see the things that are built versus going to location um and the the firehouse seems like one of the things i thought they would have tried to almost preserve because obviously that is the, it's an iconic location in new york and um but then I, I, you know it's well, like, yeah yeah no totally um the 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 one in new york is a working firehouse so um uh hook and ladder eight are the the company there and right. they um i went out to new york for a well i'd like to say it was for a recce it was more for a jolly really just to go <laughs> to the ghostbusters firehouse yeah, of course. Uh, my boss sent me out there because she knew she was like you you'd love to go out there why don't you go out and like check in with the, the yeah. American art department because they were going to do exterior scenes in new york for driving past and all that right yeah <clears throat> but we copied that verbatim down to chewing gum on the yeah, wall the doors and handles you know, and we windows did it and... we did that and and the, the other reason is that not, not a lot of people know mm-hmm. uh this but the interiors from the original mm-hmm. so venkman's office and you know the, the the columns and all that right that was um an interior in los angeles that's a firehouse in los angeles uh, um okay. so they did all the interiors uh for ghostbusters in hollywood and right. they did all the exteriors in new york, new york. um right. and they've never been composite together obviously because you can't so if you watch ghostbusters 2 where mm-hmm. you see lewis running out of the he comes running out after the car right. out of the new york um uh out of the new york uh, firehouse yeah. and the doors behind him are open and you can see in and it's a completely different only for a split second right. you can see it and it's a completely different you know, right. it's not the LA location. Right. Okay. Yeah. So it's really funny because you don't know until until you know, and then you yeah. watch it back and you go, "Oh my god, yeah!" It's totally, you never totally realize. Yeah. And the other thing, the the Los Angeles one is 150 feet long, right? Uh, inside, um, and the New York one is only 98 feet long, right? So you can't fit the two inside each other. Together. But we did on the stage. We composite them together. Yeah. So and you'd never know. Um, and we did, and we did the upstairs you know the upstairs of the with the fire and stuff um, yeah and uh they were all composites on different stages but it was it was great you know i mean that was a like kid in a candy shop for me i was just absolutely in my element i never i will never work on a film i don't think in the future and be that excited to go to work every day it yeah. was just the best thing. i mean stuff like like you're saying like batman like ghostbusters it's, it's things we all group up, up with and getting to work on you know like certain franchises and things and things i've got to work on that i thought i'd never get to work on as well it's like yeah it's the inner child and you you're always like oh you know then if oh, you could see me absolutely. now you know it's, it's oh you know. i had that like all the time like i was you know they did a props thing uh on ghostbusters where oh, the, the backpack um, and stuff and the, the well they got everything out yeah and they said they it was mainly for the prop guys mm-hmm. to give them a lowdown on like so this is a pke meter this is a blah 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 this mm-hmm. is a you know radio control trap this is a blah 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 so and the producer eric reich did this sort of walkthrough with mm-hmm. them all and i was just fanning out over everything and going oh yeah. my god that's in the background of the first one when they when they when they um, get kicked out of the university and the guy with the headphones is wheeling that out, they've got that here. Oh yeah. my God. It was like over this silly props, you know? Yeah. And um, I just, ah, oh, it was just so good. And I can't wait for people to see it. I can't wait to sort of share stuff yeah. about it when it's released. Cause it's going to be the ultimate thing for me to sort of It, it does share. look, I mean, for the trailers I've seen so far and this, even the behind the scenes stuff they've released, it, it does look incredible. The fact that they've, you know, they've, I think they've got a lot of love and attention and care into the, into the franchise and obviously making it look good. And which is what I love about not only film but games production now is like the attention to detail that goes into stuff and 
people always like especially when i first got in the industry you'd always say that thing about like what the fuck is attention to detail but like how do you how do you train that and how do you train having attention to detail and having, but it's like it's the tiny wee you know like when i made at one point i made a gun turret as a kind of personal project in 3d and it was the stuff like up you know the captures on the top that cooled the gun when mm. i made it initially and i was talking to my, my director at the time he was like yeah but then you know because the the capsules are on a, a kind of angle that f- the liquid would actually be flat it wouldn't be the same shape as the the, the glass mm. jar it would you know i come to gravity and it would be it would be level so you have to turn the water for that way to that way i'm like who the fuck is going to look at that but when i changed it i was like oh yeah like it makes so much more sense and yeah yeah so much yeah like it's it's the tiny wee things like that is when people watch stuff or experience a piece of art they're like oh like i didn't realize how in depth i've went with that stuff and you were saying like when you recreated the firehouse like down to the chewing gum on some of the door frames and stuff mm. people might not see it initially but when you go back maybe 10 years later you're like oh look look there's you know in the corner and... it was it was a real um i gotta say the the best day was when um uh uh, Dan Aykroyd and Bill Murray came to set oh, wow. before we started shooting. Mm-hmm. I was in there mm-hmm. and there was this rumour going around of Bill Murray and Dan Aykroyd are going to come down. I was like, they're not going to come down. <laughs> they didn't come down before shooting. This was like a week before and I was just stood in the set doing something and yeah. I looked up right as they walked in the door and I went, and I just, my jaw hit the floor. <laughs> I was like, floor. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> my God. Yeah. And they came over and they were with um, Jason and uh, right. Gil mm-hmm. uh, and they were showing them around the set. Mm-hmm. And then, they, and then like Gil, bless him. Mm-hmm. It was very, cause he knows I'm a huge, he knew I was a huge Ghostbusters fan. I'm sort of like, being quiet in the background sort of like oh, yeah it's bill murray oh my god and he's introduced me uh he said oh bill this is luke he's the art director he did it and bill just came over and shook my hand and dan Aykroyd were both like this is the best set this is just this is exactly like it was in 84 and i just was oh, like wow. well i can die happy now that's, that's, that's it, it. <laughs> <laughs> thank you i'm gonna go pass away now quite yeah, exactly. in the corner so, uh, mm. and I'll, I'll never forget, I've got to write all this down at some point because I don't want to ever forget it and put it in a book or something because it was just, every day was like that. Every day yeah. I'd meet someone or someone would come in mm-hmm. or there would be a prop or there would be a something in the script that they would bring out and you'd think, oh my God, you know, this is going to be so cool and yep. all the graphics, all of the, you know, because it's all, the iconography of Ghostbusters is, it, in my mind, is like the iconography of the 80s. Yeah. You know, you kind of got you've got you've got a certain amount of things in the eighties that if if you if someone says describe the eighties, you go Ghostbusters, Back to the Future, yep. uh, I don't know, Gremlins, you know, that, that yeah. kind of that that it's up there with like um, the bigger franchises. Yeah, and it's yeah. the iconography of New York as well. You know, yeah, everything you want as a kid mm-hmm. thinking about Hollywood movies and America yep. being this you know land of free and all the rest Animation of it and, and stuff like that yeah yeah and you and you're you're stood there on a set on this iconic set that you've drawn up and overseen the build of and yeah. everyone that was in the original movie is coming yeah. up to you going this is fucking amazing mm-hmm. and i'm like oh my god you know i think it was so, really, yeah on you go no i was just so it was just you know like i said before i i don't think i will ever that's pinnacle career for me yeah. it's all downhill from that I mean, it's I like, mean, yeah, I mean, like stuff like that. Definitely, like you grew up on in Batman, and I mean, for me, it's definitely Star Wars. Like, if I ever got to work in any Star Wars franchises, it's it would be a dream come true. But like, yeah, like I think the whole thing of the eighties back then was a time when people took chances. Studios took chances on people, you know, doing well. And because even stuff like Back to the Future and Ghostbusters, trying to pitch that now, I don't think would fly as much as it did back then. You know, and no, nah, absolutely. I think especially with the fact that like there was so many good names attached to you know Ghostbusters because Dan Aykroyd and um, um, I forget the actor who passed recently who also wrote, co-wrote oh, it with Howard, him. Howard Ramis. Howard Ramis, yeah. yeah. So when they wrote that, obviously their names were attached to it because it's stuff like Saturday Night Live. They had already yeah. had you know the, the film career and stuff like that. So, yeah. but like yeah, a lot of the, the pitches back then, even stuff like Aliens. I mean, you know, definitely maybe even might have flown in a sense like a horror genre because horror gets like a wide berth because you know it's a bit weird and wonderful but mm. there's so many movies back then that you know i think i was watching plane trains and automobiles the other day and even that is like such a weird concept for a 
a kind of buddy comedy film yeah. stuff like lethal weapon you know like it's stuff where you know you look back at the 80s and 90s films and you think to yourself how did that get made and how are they not making stuff like this anymore and you know yeah. i know some directors are also trying to go back there and, and bring that era back but yeah it's definitely yeah no i definitely you know the the, the age of uh you know this sort of like 10 year run of superhero movies or even longer than that now whatever it is 12 probably yeah. nearly 15 years of superhero movies it's got to be coming to an end now it's got to be like the westerns in the you know in the 40s and 50s and yeah. then sort of trails off in the 60s and then it would only be once in a while you'd get a western movie yeah and when they were made they were great like unforgiven or tombstone or whatever yeah. um so I think that will be the thing, like going forward. I'd like to see like no superhero movies for like ten years, and then give all them of a sudden, break. Like, one comes out, and everyone goes, "Ah, oh, that's so cool!" You like know, even just um, giving them a, a like that reinvention almost, where like you go away quietly and try to find a way of making it interesting again. And like you said, in yeah. ten years' time, coming back and really like the love of the sucker punch of like, "Oh my god, here we go! Here are the stuff!" You know, and yeah. um, which upsets me a wee bit because I'm also a huge um, Blade fan, and I know they're you know still remaking that that's still in the works of that getting made and yeah. um i know having watched the game awards recently they're making uh, a game based on it as well and it takes place in paris so that's going to be interesting but like yeah so i would just like them to like you said to take a bit more time and 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 uh and uh, i don't know what it was it must have just been this whole thing of like especially during covid but even before that people just throwing money at stuff but yeah. you know with the strikes yeah. and you know people getting mistreated it wasn't even the fact that it was the writers because i was watching a lot of strike stuff it was even people like who were just pas and runners who were having to work 14 hour days but were driving home and nearly killing themselves because they were so tired they were exhausted yeah, yeah totally yeah. And, it, and you know something's got to give at the end of the day because the money was coming in mm -hmm. they were making the hand of money hand over fist and yet the crews were suffering massively yeah. because they were just you know haven't really seen a real terms pay rise for about 10 years yep. and um you know don't get me don't get me wrong we are well compensated for what we do yeah very well it's a very well paid job but mm -hmm. it isn't um there's no uh security in it so yeah. i don't have a pension i don't have it's private like health care or anything like that I'm, yeah. yeah i'm i'm if i'm out of work that's it you know yeah. shit what do i do yeah. um yeah. but uh there's there, there's been this disparity for a long time i always used to say like you know how many times can a big star get paid 27 million pounds a movie right. how many times do you get a 27 million pound payday before you turn around and go do you know what actually i've got enough money yeah i'll do it why don't you share that 27 million amongst the crew and that'll yep. give every crew member a 50 grand bonus you know yep uh and that would make everyone happy, would make everyone want to come and work. Because at the end of the day, that actor is getting paid 27 million quid. He's only there for six weeks. Even like, if not even paid, every day. Even if it gets paid you know? 25 and you take 2 million away from it, and that goes around the crew. Yeah, like, exactly. Yeah. And then, you know, the crew that are there day in, day out, 12 hours a day, six days a week for six months, mm -hmm. you know, and they can't afford to take a break in between jobs because they just can't. They've got to go straight on to the next one. Yep. something isn't right there in my yeah. opinion i think it's you know i mean um, it's, it's interesting the fact that i came from an engineering background and so i worked in the railway and the uk railways industry so yeah. I worked with network rail and um you know we had from day one pensions sick leave but that's because guys like my dad back in the 70s and 80s stood on picket lines to get that stuff you know you know mm -hmm. part of their, their, their t's and c's but it was weird to me in an industry where you know you could be sacked at any time you know there was never a guarantee of sick leave or, or maternity leave or you know pensions and stuff like that and you know coming from places where unions were a, a norm and then into this industry mm -hmm. it's like well, why don't but it's weird how places like you know like the animation industry in america for example the guys work at disney and stuff like that the animators guild have a thing where you know like you're guaranteed so many days off you know you get so much sick leave you get so many it needs to be industry wide like we especially like you said during like the stuff where people are now being laid off like and at moments notice like we just talked about riot this is yeah. why we need unions because you know like studios have been getting away from that for way too long there's a whole uh, article i read on like how games production is really like hitting a something now because you get this whole thing of like four to five years in a project and as soon as the game is released everybody gets laid off you know and we've got to yeah. try and stop that way of like people getting burnt out and then dying for like a year because like they've got nothing else to work on and then it comes back and they've got to change studios they've got to change countries they've got to move 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 um, and yeah. 
you know, especially in America, like he's like, oh, that's on the East Coast, oh, it's on the West Coast, oh, it's in the middle. God, just people get fucking fed up, and you can't raise a family, you can't settle, you can't buy a house, you know, especially if you work where most of the work is in LA. You know, it's like a million pound a house out there. Like you're, <laughs> you're yeah. never or London. London's yeah. just exactly the same, right? So I mean, it's yeah, yeah. Um, it's it's a misnomer that it's this the kind of uh, um, you know, uh, glamorous. I mean, you know, I mean, there is there is glamour in there, but it's not like you know, you got to have a real reality check when you're sat in a porter cabin on a rainy Tuesday in the middle of Slough. Yep. <laughs> like. Oh, this is it. Yeah. <laughs> like, like, you my Hollywood meet, mansion, you know. You, you got to meet Dan Aykroyd, or fucking fantastic. I need to go back to work now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. yeah. yeah, you've got to come home and empty the bins. And like, oh, right. oh, yeah. I know. <laughs> so, so, yeah. 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 It, it, it's one of these things, I think it's not going to get fixed overnight, but definitely needs to get fixed. That's, that's the, oh, the, totally. And like... um you know, I'm not. I'm not saying that every, like, we should get paid loads more or anything like that. But it just it does really um, stick in the craw a little bit when they turn around and say, you know, for the, so these strikes, for example, no one no one consulted me on whether actors or writers could strike. But yeah. I was expected to just stand by and and support them wholeheartedly. Yeah. You know. Mm-hmm. And now I'm hearing reports that now now things are coming back and trickling back to work. Mm-hmm. People are being asked to take pay cuts because mm-hmm. of all the money that was lost over the strikes. And it's like there's no actors or writers sticking up for us now, you know. So I, yeah. I feel I get a little bit like, nah, mm-hmm. I'm, I just kind of feel really uh, I'm quite angry about it, to be honest, because... Yeah, I mean... I- it 100% makes sense and this is the thing we were talking about with a lot of the industry guys I spoke to who were saying you know the actors are one thing and you know and don't get me wrong like you know we talk about like Brian Cranston doing the speech and stuff like that and he's probably got enough money he can take time off but you know but there was also day actors who are guys that are extras who maybe get you know three four hundred a day or something like that so they're no yeah. rich but they also struck but the hope is that that then has a domino effect where because they have then went to the board to try and get more rights, that that will cascade down to us eventually, and we'll also get more rights. But the thing is, it probably will be a thing at one point where you guys will have to strike. The, the artists in the industry will have to strike on their own because yeah. they also. But it's difficult because I think I don't think I don't think we have as much power as the actors. I think if we went on strike, you know, we definitely things wouldn't get done. But I don't know if we would hold as much weight or gravitas as the actors and the writers you know what i mean it's, yeah. it's difficult construction have got a great union they yeah. they um they were going they they went in for their they have an annual sort of pay rise and meet up and stuff yeah and uh i remember i was on doctor strange mm-hmm. in so that was 2015 mm-hmm. and then their annual thing come through in the and packed the producers union mm-hmm. had already preemptively said we're not going to agree to any terms whatever they want we're not agreeing to terms this time so mm-hmm. all of the head hod um construction managers mm-hmm. phoned everyone up on that one day right and said, right tools down go home we're not mm-hmm. going to do this so they everyone put their tools down and within two hours of them putting the tools down they got everything they wanted <laughs> so it's like <laughs> yeah the art okay. department did that they'd just go well, we'll just find someone else <laughs> I know, and, and that's the difficult thing. Is like you know, I remember getting told that really early on about the fact that, especially in games, because a lot of the guys who work in games early on, and a lot of the juniors, you know, when I got to I mean, still a project I can never talk about, but I got to work on a AAA project, you know, for a, a games company, and it was a dream come true, definitely working on that. But you know, it's one of these things where you do feel every moment you're replaceable, that somebody could just come in the backy and just like that take your job off you, and mm. it's not a great feeling. And I think studios for so many years have took advantage of you know like you know even the a triple a interviewed for at one point the starting salary they were offering me was like the money you would get at mcdonald's as a manager you know it's like four years in a, a university getting a degree and then all the experience and interning like to then turn around and be like well cool we can offer you this amount of money you know it's like i don't know 23 24k and you're like really <laughs> really <laughs> you know your company makes how many million off this yeah. video game or this film and you know you can't pay me you know, so I think the, the, the tax, um, the, the tax uh, breaks that they get 
for example. That's why it boomed here for so long because mm-hmm. of the tax breaks that are available to them. So I read a, a report, and you'll have to fact check this, but yeah. this was a while ago. Mm. So I'm probably just making these numbers up, but it was ex- astonishing. So I worked on Thor 2, Dark World, mm-hmm. and they made that for us. A, a, they had a UK spend of 56 million, mm-hmm. which they got whatever it was back 20% mm-hmm. back as a tax the tax break for that so they ended up they only actually spent 34 million or whatever right and the movie went on to gross uh something like 290 million right for for a 20 million spend or whatever it was 30 million spend Mm -hmm. and uh you think well who's getting all that money yeah like where's that going producers yeah (laughs) Like, I know the shareholders money. will be probably getting a lot of money, but yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Christ, the, like... the studio gets so much money. The thing, and that, that's the problem I think with the film industry as well is, is you can't replicate that constantly, and you can't always chase profit. You know, the fact that they talked about that Sound of Freedom film that came out, and I think they, they spent fifty million making it, but it's grossed about a hundred million at the box office. And there's films that do that where they make it for next to nothing, and it will do crazy money. Um, mm. Even Barbie at this point, I think is. It's, I think it's grossed a billion at this point. It's, it's yeah. close to that number anyway. Yeah. But but yeah, like Margot Robbie will not get a bump in her pay. I don't know, she might, I don't know. But, you know, like the crew won't get a bump in their pay. But then like the producers get a cut, the studio gets a cut, Mattel gets a cut, you know, mm. so it's like... Well, this, is what, this is what I couldn't understand with the actors thing as well, talking about their residuals. Mm-hmm. Like going, well, I only get, you know, I was in, I don't know, LA Law or right. whatever. Lo, 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 low end actor, not mm. not like a big star, but like you know, I was in LA Law for ten mm-hmm. years, and uh, I get thirty six dollars a week in residuals or whatever. Yeah. I'm like, and that's really low. And I go, well, that is low, but you aren't getting residuals. Yeah. I don't get a residual every time any film I've worked on ever gets shown. I'm like, no, God, I don't how many that. times Endgame's been seen? Yeah, you know, I would love to get a residual from that, even if it was a penny. <laughs> For every time it was seen, you know, Jesus Christ. Yeah. I it's, um, if it was five, six hundred pounds a month or something that could keep you going if there was no work. I well, mean, exactly. Like and then it, yeah. it, um, you know, because it's not the only thing they've done, you know, across the career. I always remember um, I did um, I did a commercial for Tesco's years ago with Martin Clunes, right. and he was telling me uh, about the residuals he got for reruns of Men Behaving Badly. And it was enough to buy his house in Dorset just from the rerun money of Men Behaving Badly on UK Gold, whatever it was. Jesus. I was like, how is that? What? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's yeah. like... Uh, yeah. um, it's, it's the dice you're always being an actor also because if you have screen time and you have a significant role, like even stuff like UK TV, like, you know, Ron Atkinson must be, you know, taking him... And God knows how much money between Mr. Bean and Blackadder and stuff like you that. Think, you know, exactly. Mr. Bean, there's only 14 episodes of Mr. Bean. Yeah, it's, it's, it's run forever and ever. <laughs> I mean, like it's, and, uh, yeah. But I think the point I was trying to make was like, if you're going to do residuals, it should be across the board for everyone that worked on the film down to the caterer. Yes. You know, everyone yeah. should get a cut of it when if it's rerun. Yeah. You know, it shouldn't just be the actors because, yeah. you know, yeah. When I used to work I used to work in a pizza hut, right? And I worked right. in the kitchens when I was a student, right? Uh-huh. And the front of house staff would get tips, right? Yeah. And they were told they had to pull their tips and share them amongst themselves. So right. one person on the floor might get five dot five pound tip, yeah. and then another person might make fifty pounds tips, but they'd have to pull it at the end and then share it amongst themselves. But they never shared it with the kitchen staff who were doing all the dog okay. work. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly it's exactly the same thing. It's like, well, hang on a minute, but how's that fair? That's not fair. Yeah. You know, if you're going to get a residual, I want a residual. Yeah. Right. Um, but now yeah. I'm ranting. No, 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 no. But it, it's right in what you're saying. I think because we started on the strikes, and it's one of these things that, like, yeah, the, 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 there's so many things that still need addressed within the art departments, and 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 the art department for I think for the longest time in a lot of productions, not even just what we do in films and games, but like you know, animation across the board, TV you know they are like the unsung heroes you know even people like grips you know people who like yeah. are, you know have a particular job and do things and everybody really needs to be acknowledged as like what's the phrase it takes a village you know like you, absolutely ghostbusters absolutely. doesn't come out of thin air you know you hire a crew because you want to hire the best but then 
you know, they build these. And the, the thing that always guts me as well is the fact that you spend so long making these incredible sets, stuff like the firehouse. And then once it's done, production's finished, it's torn down and it's thrown in a bin. You know, like it's it's no, you know, you take a million pictures and people get to walk about it for so long. But like, you know, these things are like, you feel like you have nothing to show at the end of it. And then it, it, yeah. you're on, like, on to the next production, you're on to the next thing. And, it, you know, yeah. it's it's difficult. It, it, was, it was quite uh, quite upsetting, actually, because that was <laughs> one of the jobs where I actually stayed around for the for them to start taking it apart. Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I'd spent so long putting it up and yeah. making it amazing. I was like, it's kind of like the death of a friend, you know, <laughs> kind of like want to be there to make sure it all, all went all right. It's treated right. And, yeah. yeah. And I had the, uh, the props guys were like ripping off the, um, the letters on the front of the firehouse yeah. just like with no care you know just like ripping it off and like everything's breaking apart and like, and you're like oh God. Just, I mean and they just literally just push the walls over and you yeah. know like, oh, you know, really like <laughs> do you get to do you get to, I mean like un- unofficially but do you get, do you ever like keep a like any of this stuff or get to get take anything back or like keep a part of it or is it any yeah other- I I do. I always keep, I always take a little bit of something. I got, um, so I, I had a deal with, um, uh, the prop man. We had a, the, the Ghostbusters sign that hangs outside the firehouse, the big one. Right. Um, I don't know how much I can tell you about why I've got it, but uh, <laughs> I have got it. It's, it's, it's you got to keep character. something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. By the way, this is the funny thing. It's like even stuff like when you watch Graham Norton and there's guys like Ryan Gosling talking about working on like Blade Runner and stuff. And he was like, oh, you must have, it's an iconic franchise. You must have got to keep something. And he's like, oh, I might have, <clears throat> or I might have no kept. You know, even there, like the actors who get, or like the the biggest things, the biggest part of the production. And even they're like, oh yeah, totally <clears throat> got to <clears throat> keep something. <clears throat> it's like, um, I remember that was the funniest thing I ever saw when it was you McGregor because he was always like, "Oh, you worked on Star Wars? Did you get to keep anything?" He was like, "I might or might not have have uh, been given a lightsaber," <clears throat> you know. And he was even sketchy about it. And I'm like, "You were Obi Wan fucking Kenobi. Of course you're going yeah, yeah. to keep son. <laughs> You'd be expecting to." Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean, yeah. But it's, it's things like um, little props or or even like graphics. Mm. Like the graphics guys on on this, they they knew I was a huge Ghostbusters fan. They basically they turned around. And they said at the end of it, they gave me a big bump of like. Ghostbusters, um, you, you know, like signs, right. s- stickers, the things they built for them. Just things that are like, oh, that's a nice thing to keep and like raise a cult um, uh, business cards or like right. Ghostbusters business cards. Yeah. Or um, which you look back on years from now and think, oh, I remember when I worked on, you know, yeah, exactly. So it's all, all nice things, and then, you know, I've got, I've got like, um, I've got the the lamp from Aladdin, right? I've got. Um, what else have I got? Yeah, it's, it's like it's, it's like as, as the smaller stuff. It's not like you're going to walk away with a proton pack or something like because they take no, um, no. some That's of the stuff takes like thirty grand to build. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I tell you, if, I just I, have we got time for a quick story? No, no, have... firing, firing. Yeah. yeah. So the um, one of the things I had to do was um, test the um, the pole for the firehouse. <laughs> so we made a mock up of the pole. Yeah in the workshop so we, mm. we built a, just a scaff pole yeah um did did the hole uh in the thing because we wanted to see if you could fit through the hole with a proton pack on right um and uh because it's only three foot wide you see yeah and then the pole's in the middle so that's one foot six so right you gotta think the depth of your body then the depth of the thing you're gonna pack at the back yeah it's gonna hit the as you go through the hole yeah so i had to like make up these several mock-ups to see the best fit for everything mm-hmm. and uh my boss said to me um can you go down uh and get the proton packs they've got them down in the thing and she said you might as well if you put it on mm-hmm. uh then you can get, you go down the pole and you, you test it have a go like, it's yeah. fine whatever so I went down and it was the real proton pack and then the, mm-hmm. the, the um the uh costume designer comes out of nowhere and she says um oh Eve, the designer, my boss. She said, mm-hmm. "Oh, Eve said you wanted to wear this, mm-hmm. and it was the uh, um, Venkman's screen worn flight suit." <laughs> so I've got a picture of me in in the screen worn Bill Murray mm-hmm. Venkman flight suit mm-hmm. with his proton pack on, yeah. and I've never looked that happy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I can picture of me just like absolutely beaming. Yeah, beaming. So yeah, it, it's one of those things like. Yeah. The, the job people always say to me oh it must be amazing your job and i think like a lot of the time 
I would say like, oh, it's all right, you know. But then things like that happen. You go, actually, yeah, it's pretty fucking cool what I do. It's I mean, pretty- we've definitely kind of ratted about like the, the unfairness of parts of the job. But I think later down the line in your life, when you go back and look at the kind of moments, it's something that like people will live their whole life working in an office. They'll never get to experience anything like that. And the yeah. fact that at one point you can sit at dinner parties and to your friends and stuff like that. Oh, I remember when I met Dan Aykroyd, you know, in the Ghostbusters set. And people will be like, what the fuck? Like, how the fuck did that? You know, it, you know, it's. I think it's the sacrifice we make as artists is that you have to give a bit of your soul. You have to give a bit of your being to be in this industry and sacrifice so much. But moments like that are the things you'll look back on at the end of the day when you remember about how you lived your life. And, you know, I think the biggest thing for me was when I left my job, people told me two things. One, that I would never graduate university because nobody would take me in my older age and, and I didn't have any qualifications. That was obviously fucked the minute I walked in the, the, the hall to get my, my degree in my hand. But And then the other two was, I'd, the other thing they told me was like, I'd never have my name in, in, in a credits for a video game and I've been in several. So it's like, you know, people always have this thing about like, you know, living an ordinary life. And I think it's one of these things that you and I have of like, you didn't want to be like everybody else. You want to have these moments in your life where you've done something different with your time and you feel like you accomplished a bit in life by working on these major productions. And again, it's the things that, you know, the pay is unfair and the hours and whatever else and things need to be sorted, of course. But um, it, it does make you happy that you get to have these experiences in life of working on these amazing things. So yeah, that's, man, that's the trade-off. Yeah. Absolutely, 100%. And uh yeah. I don't think, you know, there's, there's been times where I've been like, you know, oh, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, yeah. oh, it's a young man's game, yeah. you know, getting <laughs> up early and traveling across London in the freezing weather and things. And they just think, yeah. oh, and then there's times like that where you just go, actually, you know, you got a call to say, can you come and work in Ghostbusters? And you're like, yeah. fuck yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, where'd I sign up? Um, I got, that was, the, that was the best day ever that, cause I got, <laughs> <laughs> I heard that they were making Ghostbusters. So this is the, this is the funny story, right? Yeah. As you probably can tell, I'm a huge Ghostbusters fan. Yes. Complete nerd out on Ghostbusters. And, uh, I've got a supervised art director friend of mine, uh, called Andrew Palmer, mm-hmm. who is also a huge Ghostbusters fan. And, Bill Murray fan, and we, mm-hmm. you know, when we work together, we just quote Bill Murray stuff all the time to each other, and blah blah blah. blah. Anyway, we went to see um, uh, uh, oh, Afterlife. Right. We went to see Afterlife at uh, at the BFI or somewhere I can't remember yeah. when it first came out, and um, we loved it. And then on the way out, we were talking. We we're like, God, wouldn't it be amazing if they did the Ghostbusters film in the UK? could happen oh yeah it could happen and I'm like, anyway cut to six months later mm-hmm. he phones me up he's like they're doing ghostbusters in england like, what <laughs> <laughs> we've got to find out who's doing it so yeah, yeah, yeah. i spent two weeks trying to find out it was like it, the biggest secret nobody knew who was doing it like, who's right. doing it? who's doing ghostbusters who's doing ghostbusters so at the time i was doing this netflix film uh called uh back in action it's not out yet Okay. It was a Cameron Diaz thing. Right, right. And um, I'm on there, and one of the guys who I work with, a guy called Ben Telford, who right. actually I got him on board. He, he, was, he spent years doing uh, TV stuff, mm-hmm. and I got him on. He wanted to do features, so I, I basically put his name forward, and he, he ended up on this job, and we got mm-hmm. Pally on that because we met through Instagram. Anyway, that's right. another story. And... Um, I'm with him one lunchtime and I said, and he's, you know, what, you know, just, we're just chatting shit. And he, and I said, Oh, I'm trying to find this, uh, trying to find out who's supervising Ghostbusters. Cause, uh, mm-hmm. it's like, nobody knows, nobody knows. And he's like, Oh, I know who's doing it. It's, uh, that, you know, blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. I won't say his name just mm-hmm. in case of the con- um, thing. Yeah. But he's doing it. Uh, I was like, what? Oh, have you got his number? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I phoned the guy up. I was like, Oh, my name's Luke. I'm an art director. Um, mm-hmm. Um, I heard you're doing Ghostbusters, and he's like, "Nah, sorry, mate, fully crewed now." I was, and I was like, "No, fuck, yeah." So I said, "Can I send a CV anyway?" And he said, "Yeah, yeah, send a CV." So I sent him a CV, and lucky for me, you know, CV's got some pretty big things on it. Right. He phoned me back, uh, literally within two minutes, and was like, mm-hmm. "Can you meet me tomorrow?" <laughs> I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah." So I snuck out of work to meet him at a local pub. Right. And he just laid it all on the table and he said, uh, and he was like, you know, 
going to be doing Ghostbusters. It's back in the firehouse, mm. building the firehouse, blah, 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 blah. And he said, mm. and he said, I want you to do the firehouse. And I just was like, yes. <laughs> this is like the best day ever. Yeah. I'll never forget that. It was yeah. a, that was the, the the and I had to really hold in my sort of like oh, oh my god I can't scream. believe it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just, just like yeah yeah I'll do that yeah 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 I'll, oh yeah I'll see if I've got time you know I'll check the schedule <laughs> <laughs> check the calendar <laughs> and then I had to like wangle out of my contract with the uh, with the uh, back in action to get right. on to Ghostbusters as well yeah. I've never done that before but I mean I, thought, dream, I, can't, I, can't, I can't turn this down I've got to no of course actually said to my boss like they want me to do the firehouse and he's like wait well, you should go you've got yeah. to go you know okay. you're never gonna get a chance to do that ever again and that's the yeah. thing is like it's like it's like working on the original ghostbusters people will talk about that have that worked on that 20 years later like oh working yeah. ghostbusters you know so at least yeah. you can say um which is interesting you talk about like how things were made and you were given someone's phone number it's like the games industry so much of it is done online through email through facebook and instagram through like art station like you know recruiters you know reaching out to you in linkedin there's mm. very few of which i thrive on and that's why I've, I've the podcast has done so well and i've been able to travel across the world is mm. because i'm great at just standing in a room and talking to people like you and i are doing just now yeah um but so much of the art industry and the games especially sector is you know you'll put stuff online and people just contact you through email and through it's it's less like you know and again because i think the film industry in london and the uk is such a tight-knit industry but i think because the games stuff is almost international it's harder mm. to then have those in-person one-to-one conversations, um, which do occasionally happen. I know people who went to events and met art directors and they've showed them their sketchbook and been like, oh, you should come down to the studio like tomorrow and we'll talk about something, maybe get you a job. Um, mm. But it's rarer. It's There's less of that and it's, you know, the, the stuff you're doing obviously with film. Um, but I think it's a lost art that I think should come back because you get a better sense of someone when you do it like that. Oh, definitely. I mean, I, that's how I always, always have done it is mm. through phoning, f- just phoning around, yep. seeing who's doing what, yep. you know, getting on people's radar. Because if yep. you send a faceless email, mm-hmm. it's all, you have to really like hit the, um, like someone has to be actively looking for a draftsman or whatever right. when you email them for yeah. them to go, Oh, yeah. I'm looking for a draftsman. I'll phone them straight back. Yeah. If they're not actively looking at that exact moment, that email will just disappear within 24 hours and they'll yeah. forget all about it. Never again. So you've got to constantly phone people and say, yeah. you know, oh, just, you know, mm-hmm. spoke to you last week. I just wondered if you're any further along. Blah, 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 yeah. you know, yeah. All of that. So, yeah, I always tell people to do that. It's a really good one. Um, so the, the, the conversation has been great. Um, but for the last 10 minutes, let's talk about another part of what you're doing just now because you're obviously doing your feature stuff still and you're working in whatever else but um you know a big thing that people have talked about recently is you know your instagram and that's kind of taken off and your posts are kind of getting attention and you're selling classes um so you're selling classes specifically for what you do which is production yeah. and set production for feature films exactly well it started off as um so i use sketchup and layout so i use sketchup for modeling and then i use layout which is the program that comes with sketchup for yep. the drafting and all the, all the construction drawings um and i have a method and then in in during lockdown 2020 the uh so, not loads but like a few people got in touch and said oh would, would i be up for doing some one-on-one lessons with them yeah um like zoom lessons and i was like i'm not really mm-hmm. i haven't got the patience to do that but i thought yep. well I'll, I'll do a I'll do a little tutorial and I'll put it, I'll start a YouTube channel. Right. And, um, start doing this tutorial. And then I, I realized, oh, it's, it's a bit more, it's a bit more involved than a, a YouTube video. A quick video by yeah. this point, it was like two or three hours long. Anyway, right. the first, the first course ended up being 10 hours. And I basically take you from the right at the beginning of opening SketchUp for the first time to mm-hmm. getting a brief. Mm-hmm then working out how to interpret the brief, mm-hmm. building a model, which is a New York loft apartment, mm-hmm. sort of a stylized New York loft, mm-hmm. um, and then doing all the drawings from it. So we do a plan elevation in the first masterclass. The second one, we do all the window detailing. Mm-hmm. The third one, we do all the doors. And then I've got the fourth one coming out uh, in February, which is right. always, like, all to do with staircases. Mm-hmm. And if, you, if you're looking to build a portfolio or Le- just learn SketchUp. Like originally, it was it was catered towards um, set designers, 
right. but I've actually got more people um, involved. So that whole thing, and then in February, you're going to have like a kind of end end or point to the end of it. Yeah, so you, could, you so you work through it, and you, you by the end of it, if you if you did all four courses, you'd have like 10, 12 drawings for your portfolio, right. which you could then apply to whatever. But it's turned out lots of people that have done it are architects, interior designers, mm-hmm. people that just want to learn SketchUp. People who would want to want to move from two D to three D. So I've yep. got like a whole gamut of of students, not just yep. film people. So that's been really nice. Actually, it's been really good. And and um, yeah, my my I've just set up a new website, whitelockdesignlimited.com. dot mm-hmm. So you can go over there and check out check out the the the, um, the courses. Yep. I do asset packs. So I do like um, one of the things we do in the film industry is like lots and lots of sash windows and Georgian doors. So mm-hmm. rather than having to remodel them or redraw them every job you go to, I've done a, I've done asset packs where you can pick them out, you know, and I've, it's got like 80 different windows, 80 different doors, mm-hmm. like a sci-fi kit bash where you can just mm-hmm. kit bash together some sci-fi stuff and some rendering. Um, so the whole thing really is uh, born out of um, uh, lockdown and it's yeah. turned into like a little side business. So I'm quite, you know, quite pleased about how that's yeah. kind of gone. Cause it's, it's helped me weather the storm of these strikes. That's for yeah. sure. Yeah. Um, but, but then yeah. again, it's, what, it's something that I think with time and money and energy, like you know, as the as as things like this happen, as interviews happen, as the years go on, I think it would become things like it's more popular, and then it might become more and more. You know, I've seen people in our industry do the same, where they'll start and it will be a slow burn initially, but then years down the line they're the tutorials everybody goes to so if anybody's wanting to learn stuff it's like oh you need to go look at look stuff you know it'll be a thing where it'll, it'll build and build and build and build until eventually you're doing more stuff and more and more and more teaching um so yeah it's, it's a good starting point to b- start building stuff like that at least yeah definitely and i i love i love showing people how you know how good sketchup is because it, it gets a bad rap a lot of the yep. time cause people don't know how to use it and they mm-hmm. kind of uh they presume that they know how to use it because it looks like a simple program yeah and it's actually incredibly powerful. Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, not to sound too big headed, but just go and have a look at my Instagram and the stuff that I do with it, you know. Oh, yeah, of course. So, um, Even the guys I know who do, uh, you know, work at ILM and stuff like that, who do like, you know, concept stuff for film and stuff. And a lot of the guys just sketch up and stuff. It's raving about yeah, it all the time. Yeah, absolutely. So. It's, a, yeah. it's a great, it's a great tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's fantastic for architecture and uh, architectural things. Mm-hmm. Not necessarily, I mean, it does have one flaw in that can't really do organic shapes mm-hmm. um but i don't ever f- really find myself needing to do organic stuff everything i do is building related you know yep. doors windows furniture set decoration stuff yeah yeah exactly so it's um it's great for that and and uh yeah i mean i i, I can't really s- say yeah, much more about it really it's kind of yeah. that's what it is yeah yeah well, if you guys want to check any of that stuff out, obviously the links will all be down below. I'll make sure I'll, I'll link all Luke's stuff in his website and all his courses. So if you want to check that stuff out, it'll all be there. Um, but then we've got to try and wrap it up because Luke has a life to get back to and I'm sure work to get back to as well. So um, I'm not going to keep him here forever. But um, but yeah, just again, uh, thanks for coming on, Luke, and, and chat. No worries. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Appreciate it. Um, so yeah, like I said, you know, links will be down below. You can check out Luke's stuff, and I'll link onto all his socials so you can uh, chat with him if you need. He's really great, actually. And the fact that we are talking now is because I, I just reached out one day and started chatting. So he's always uh, approachable in that way. Yeah, and you check it as well. Always, I always try and answer my DMs uh, yeah. whenever anyone gets in touch. So yeah, happy to chat to anyone if they want advice or yeah, whatever. Fantastic. Okay. Okay, guys, well, that's it for the interview. Um, and again, like I said, thanks to Luke for coming on. Thanks to you guys for listening to this point. And uh, yeah, check out the rest of the episodes that are on the Jill uh, podcast. You can find us on uh, YouTube, of course, that we do most of these on, but we're also on stuff like Spotify, and Google Podcasts, iTunes, and uh, the usual places to find your podcast. And uh, yeah, uh, again, we'll just see you guys in the next episode. And thanks for being here. Bye, guys. Bye.